It's February 24th, 1797, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Forget the legions of Rome and forget the Viking raids. The last land invasion of Britain was the rather underwhelmingly named Battle of Fishguard, which ended ignominiously on this day in 1797. Yeah, so Julius Caesar, when he popped over with his invading force, he landed on the Kentish beaches. And when the Normans came, they selected the gentle slopes of Pevensey Bay over in Eastbourne. But the French decided to land on this tiny cove surrounded by quite high sea cliffs and the dangerously rugged north coast of Pembrokeshire in Wales. And yet there was a logic to it, given that England had put most of its troops on the eastern coast, expecting any sort of invasion from France to come from that direction. And it was bloody windy. So they ended up there unintentionally. They'd set off (laughs) hoping to invade Britain from Bristol, which at the time was the second biggest shipping port in Britain. Then it got really, really windy and they had to abandon the whole plan and divert to Wales. Yeah, so this was the only remaining prong of a three-pronged attack, which is part of the reason why it did turn out to be so unimpressive. So that very windy weather which you spoke of was what put off the other two prongs of the plan. So the main thrust was supposed to be coming from Ireland. The idea was that the French general, General Usch, would land 15,000 troops there and he'd link up with native Irish rebels and they would then invade Britain. And there was another small force that was supposed to go to Newcastle and act as a distraction there. But what actually happened was the sea was so rough that that fleet had to put in in the Netherlands for shelter. And then the crew just refused to go on. And eventually they became so mutinous that they had to turn back to France. So that was the reason that there were only about 1,200 men who landed on the beaches at Fishguard. And Napoleon wasn't even that bothered about invading Britain, by the way. He wanted Ireland. Like he knew, obviously, Mm. there was a lot of anti-British feeling in Ireland. So the idea was just to create a diversion by invading England, or as it turned out, Wales, to pull the English troops away from Ireland so that Napoleon could have a go at Ireland. So once the boat couldn't get to Ireland you'd think they'd stop doing the diversionary bit because well, what's the point? I, yeah, I couldn't find a historical explanation for why they didn't just call the whole thing off. They were like, no, you 1,200 guys go over there and you get things started. And then when the weather calms down, we'll send the other like 15,000 troops. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the thing is that like once you're sort of dragging your sorry asses up this craggy headland and you're just sort of, you know, you've, you've come halfway there. You're like, do you know what? Let's just finish this invasion that we've bloody well started and, and <laughs> see how it goes. But, you know, regardless of the motivation for this prong going ahead, it was pretty impressive. Like early the following day, they'd managed to haul up no less than 47 barrels of gunpowder, 50 tonnes of ammunition, as well as grenades and flintlock muskets. So this really wasn't a, a, like a lightly armed invading force. Yeah, that would be a really good night's work if they worked in a warehouse. But in terms of invading Britain, it was still <laughs> a little bit less than what was required. And by the next day, they had only managed to conquer a couple of farmhouses, which resulted in a few skirmishes with the locals who they had assumed would be very anti-English but it turns out that they didn't appreciate a bunch of random French soldiers just you know turning up at their houses being like here we are to help you not least because they weren't soldiers at all they were prisoners half of them who mm. had literally been let out of prison given an army uniform and told go and invade Wales well go and invade yeah. Bristol and then if you fail to do that invade Wales <laughs> so they weren't particularly motivated either when they got there, I don't think, to really do the job. You know, they, they were probably, I imagine, quite happy to just be on terra firma. Yeah, I think there were 600 regular soldiers and the rest were irregular soldiers and deserters and convicts. And just like royal prisoners that the army had dragooned to form a penal battalion, which sounds like the, the worst kind of way to do time possible to not only be stripped of your freedom, but then also put in an army and shot at... <laughs> <laughs> so it's no wonder that like not all of them uh, were playing ball and uh, and following orders. Their uh, their nickname was La Légion Noire, but it wasn't because of their dark deeds. It was apparently because they were wearing captured British uniforms that had then been dyed in black or brown dye, which kind of suggests that they weren't necessarily the most treasured Légion in the French army if they were being basically given captured uniforms that had a little bit of dylon thrown on them. 
And this actually proved to be crucial during the invasion because the well-trained regular troops stuck by their leader, who was a chap called Colonel Tate. He was an Irish-born American who had had to flee the USA because working on behalf of the French, he raised a band of mercenaries who were supposed to be taking back Florida from Spain. And America was just like, get out, just leave. Uh, So he did. And so these 600 well-trained men stayed with him. Unfortunately, the other 600 scarpered pretty much as soon as their feet hit the sand. And they went running off looking for boots and they happened to find a lot of it because the locals had just salvaged heaps and heaps of Portuguese wine from this ship that had been wrecked on the shore. So there was wine everywhere. So they started going to town immediately. (laughs) I thought that detail was just like a horrible histories sort of fun thing, you know? But no, every single source that has documented this invasion says they all went round absolutely off their tits. Like, so immediately, as soon as they were there, this, this conquering army just got drunk. Which, yeah, may have been a good relieving balm for them, but isn't the best way to win hearts and minds. I mean, the soldiers that they first encountered weren't the creme de la creme of the uh, British forces either, it must be said. So the group that was marshalled to resist them was led by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Knox, who, when he first heard about uh, this thing that was going on, had to leave the ball that he was attending to uh, put together his uh, fish guard volunteers. But he had no combat experience himself. And so he pulled these troops together and then they started marching towards these 600 Uh, well-trained and by now quite established and dug in French troops uh, and got sort of relatively close and then slightly lost their nerve and turned around and started going in the opposite direction, whereupon they by chance bumped into Lord Cordor and his Pembrokeshire yeomanry. uh, And uh, and Cordor was like, "Uh, I think you're going the wrong way, lads. Uh, Let's go and get the French back in that direction. So he assumed control and took them forward from there. Yeah, I think probably worth saying that the militia commander, this Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Knox, his only qualification for leading that regiment was that he was the son of the wealthy landowner who had funded the militia. And so even with the Fish Guard militia and the Pembrokeshire militia and 150 sailors who had turned up with nine cannons, the British response force still only totaled about 700 troops. So by rights, they should have been outnumbered two to one if it weren't for the fact that half of the French forces were lying around drunk in various <laughs> places, including 12 drunk Frenchmen right. who had been locked in a church in Fishguard by a local woman called Jemima Nicholas. She rounded up a party of women and they captured 12 drunk French soldiers and locked them up in the church. Yeah, but when you count the troops, therefore, it's wrong to just count the men, isn't it? Because obviously the local women were considered a threat to these invading Frenchmen. Sometimes because they were obviously a bit fearsome, like this Jemima Nicholas, who apparently was armed with a pitchfork, (laughs) and that's all when she went (laughs) after these guys. But also other wives in Fishguard who are said, perhaps unintentionally, to have masqueraded as British soldiers, which is the wackiest story ever. Um, oh, I love this, <laughs> Apparently, yeah. the local Welsh garb is easily mistaken from a distance to be British soldiers advancing over the hill, which spooked the French. If this story is to be believed, this was part of the thinking of the invading force, that they were like, wow, we actually are outnumbered, even though, do you know what, they really weren't outnumbered. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of what put them into a bit of a panic. But take was in a really awkward situation because the French ships that had deposited them there at Fishguard had already left so he didn't have much choice even though he could see how badly everything was going but we've been talking about it as if it was a bit of a you know comedic interlude there was one moment where it could have become seriously dangerous for the British which is that Lord Cordor and his forces almost walked into an ambush that had been set by some of the remaining 600 loyal French troops but they turned back at the last moment because this in this era it's so weird to think of now but they didn't fight in the winter and they didn't fight after dark. So it was starting to get a bit dark and he said, do you know what, let's turn around and go back. And they were almost on the point of walking into that ambush. But by the time that failed, there was Mm. no hope really left for this invasion. So Tate had no choice really but to surrender so he sent a couple of representatives to speak to Lord Corder who had set up in a pub on Fishguard Square it's called the Royal Oak and it's still there this is I think my favorite (laughs) detail about this because most people think that the last invasion of Britain was the Battle of Hastings it's surprising when you learn that there was a more recent one than that but it's really hilarious when you consider the sort of historical esteem with which the Battle of Hastings is still taught (laughs) that the finale that (laughs) happened on this day was signing a document in the local boozer. Napoleon effectively (laughs) signed a treaty with Britain in a Welsh pub. You can see why the French would have been feeling themselves and thinking that they actually could pull this off because this engagement took place towards the end of the War of the First Coalition, which was this five-year period where basically 
all of Western Europe ganged up on France. And what really blows my mind is that during this period, the French overthrew their monarchy. You know, you had the heads in the baskets and then you had Napoleon emerging. And despite all of this uproar at home and despite the fact that all these other countries were throwing all their forces against them, France gained some new territory in places like the Netherlands. Mm. So you can see how they thought it might actually end up going their way in the end. But also, they didn't really lose any troops here, did they? Do you, have you got any numbers on how many people actually died? It seems to have been pretty bloodless. No, I think that's right, that they kind of, the, the defeated army was marched out to drumbeat and their weapons were taken from them and then they were put on their ships and sent home. Drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. When police found you know, his little black book with all his victims in them, he was like, oh no, are they just my furniture selling clients? Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.